Hey there, uh, thanks for joining us again for our Wednesday Easy Chair Chat. I'm doing a series on the signs of the end times that Jesus describes on his Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 14. If you want the context of that, you can go back and reread that passage. The first sign that Jesus mentioned, and is the one that he repeats the most through this passage, is deception. There's a lot of deception in the world right now. And the thing about deception is it, it's usually kind of behind the scenes where it tricks you. But we are just seeing deception, evil, lies, much more prominent now, much more out in the open, where, where it makes it difficult to accept and listen to uh, authorities in almost any field of endeavor right now. I'm questioning, is this true? Is this right? Or is this a deception? When Jesus was saying, do not let them lead you astray, and that's what his word means there, he's primarily referring to false Christs and false prophets. Now, they've always existed. John said the spirit of the Antichrist was present then, even in the first century. But the thing about these signs is, even though they occur throughout history, they intensify and are more frequent at the end, like birth pangs or contractions. So I just want to discuss in a few areas of deception that I see. Let's start with the church false teaching in the church, which weakens the authority of Scripture. We could look at liberal churches that discount key Christian doctrines like the virgin birth and the deity of Christ. They don't teach that you must be born again, as Jesus said in John chapter 3. They accept and ordain homosexuals to the ministry. We could look at the health and wealth gospel, which actually encourages worldliness and materialism among Christians, or the extreme grace message, which overlooks sin and God's holiness and wrath and emphasizes only his love, which has produced a generation of Christians with easy divorce and little, if any, accountability. Our culture, the deception of Hollywood and the music industry, if you were born in the 50s like myself and started watching some television then and in the early 60s, you're shocked by what's on television today. Each decade has gotten more and more evil and permissive than what's allowed to be on television than the decade before. Look at public education and our liberal colleges, which pressure students to accept, congratulate, and conform to sin. We see over Satanism and satanic symbols in music and movies. Look up Katy Perry, Beyonce, Lady Gaga, and JC sometimes, and you will see the occult symbolism that's used in their music. The covering of one eye, the devil horns. Even our dollar bill has an occult symbol on it via the Freemasons. There's a picture in the 2015 cover of Economy, Economist magazine, which is based in London, and it's owned by the Rothschild family. It's kind of weird. This picture shows a nuclear explosion going off, and you have to wonder why would that be on the cover of a magazine dealing with the economy? And then in the world of politics, problems in the world, we, we're all evident to see that, and they're getting worse and worse. So what will be needed someday is a Messiah figure to solve these problems and bring world peace. Before the real Messiah comes, Jesus said there will be false Christs. And throughout history, and culminating in the end times, there have been and there will be, and eventually, an anti-Christ, against Christ, or instead of Christ person. Who is he? We don't know. And we could only offer guesses at best and would probably be wrong. But someday, someone is going to come on the scenes who is completely given over to Satan and filled with him and will control a one-world government.
all right as we are married I hope um, by the end of this you'll see that there's a, a marriage of sorts in this um, we can have the zest to get up in the morning and there can be a, really a driving vision that keeps us going is kind of the prop that props us up and all of a sudden for no reason at all that we know of it's like it doesn't offer any spark anymore it's it's not delivering like it did it's like we've come into some darkness with it and I, I just recently had some friends you know, share with me that they have launched out in a direction that always inspired them and at least temporarily it's like it wasn't there it's like what do you do when you've launched out you've set your sail and it's like you you don't have any direction now or any oomph for it I mean I definitely I would say frequently have it in miniature ways I definitely know what what they're talking about what do we do do we pretend it's like oh well I'm just gonna make up for what I'm not fe sensing right now I think Isaiah 50 10 through 11 speaks to what Ed is addressing in a, a hopeful way a direction way and and beyond this who among you fears the Lord and ob obeys the voice of his servant let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God then it says walk by the light of your fire or we would have called that fire sparks or by the torches you have kindled and then he says this I will tell you you will lie down in torment so we are definitely not encouraged to pretend or come up with just like these miniature lights that really are not the light of God but the knot is there but we actually were given a true direction <clears throat> I think many of us would know a song that was definitely in my youth by Bill Withers lean on me lean on me when you're not strong I'll be your friend I'll help you carry on I think for those of us who heard that tens and hundreds of times a sense of lean actually was felt and in a time when you don't really know where to go it is definitely a time to lean on the Lord to find a holding pattern a trust in the Lord and I think when Ed's sharing this we got to find that in the midst of this we may hear out of this a come up higher like um, John <clears throat> did in Revelation the call to faith trust and reliance is the true voice of all our sorrows let's look to go there okay so a holding pattern I think that's what we need to be developing right now what are you suspended and held in when it's darkness trust only trust Ecclesiastes 3 says there's a time for every season sometimes trust is all you can do one thing that can help a holding pattern is if you do know that God has allowed the darkness he's sovereign over it though he slay me yet will I trust him Job says I was dumb I opened not my mouth because thou didst it Psalms 39 9 David when he was receiving these mud pellets or dirt pellets from Shimei as he was running from his throne he said don't hurt Shimei maybe God told him to curse me so if this darkness you know that God has allowed or may be involved that helps because even Psalms 139 says the light and the dark is equal to God the dark is no problem for dark for God the dark is not too dark for him you know one quote from Spurgeon that I think has created a a hold for me when things are fuzzy and dark is not going by what we have but what we are 
not where we are, but whose we are. And to find our joy in what was suffered by the Lord. That's really a twist. But I have just kind of rehearsed those things a few times, and it has definitely been a hold. Um, I am going to quote several times an uh, expositor named McLaurin. I have found him amazingly kindred, I guess I would say, and also um, certainly expanding to the, the way I'm already feel like I'm hearing something move. He um, does think darkness, and this darkness that Psalms 50 talks about, comes from three sources. And one is what I think Ed is addressing, the, the national context. The prophet that, um, you know, in Isaiah, there was a real gloom on the land. They didn't really see a lot of hope for their nation, who walks in darkness and has no light. So those that are not fearing God, as Isaiah 50 says, are at a risk. And I'm going to read a very insightful um, warning, Isaiah 8, 19. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel for the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. When they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, these are dark arts, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? Again, dark arts. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged. And they will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they shall look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they shall be thrust into thick darkness. This, I think we can see the beginnings at, or in the heart of it, playing out, not seeing any hope and going into spiritual sources. Even we saw with um, Saul, he said, I, he inquired of the Lord and there were no dreams and no prophets, and their Urim, which had worked before. Nothing was working, so he went to the witch of Endor. We just need to be careful in our spiritual hunger, um, bleakness at times that we don't go there. We move instead into trust, that holding pattern we must. Psalms 82.5, the weak and needy stumble in the darkness while all the foundations crumble. So we hear in Habakkuk 3.18, and we, I think we love this verse. Though the fig tree will not blossom, neither there will be fruit in the vines. It talks like the failure of crops, hunger, all that. But he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, the joy of my salvation. Okay, moving aside from more of a, a national hopelessness is just the intimate one where we have been fed on by the Spirit, and all of a sudden, quote, we're lifted into another region, the spiritual, a state of feeling not unknown to devout hearts in which the religious life is devoid of joy and peace. That is a phase of Christian experience which meets anyone who knows anything of the workings of the heart and of his own heart. When faith is being exercised with but little of the light of faith, and the fear of the Lord is cherished with but scant joy in the Lord. Darkness of life or soul, however produced, whether it comes from the night of sorrow falling on us from without, our culture, or from mist and gloom rising like heavy vapors from our own heart. I got so much out of this next um, quote, and I, I hope you will too. In a sense, it's a kind of a clincher of just being known in our humanity 
with how we are grasping spiritual things and wanting to hold on to them, yet being human. Okay, faith without much joy of faith. I would not say that such experience is always the fruit of sin. No principles, be they ever so firmly held, ever so undoubtingly received, ever so passionately embraced, exert their whole power equally at all moments in a life. There come times of languor where they seem to be mere words, dear commonplaces, as unlike their former selves, as sapless winter boughs to their summer pride of leafy beauty. The same variation in all are realizing the, the grasp affects the truth of the gospel. Sometimes they seem but words with all the life and power sucked out of them. No facts are always equally capable of exciting their corresponding emotions. Those which most closely affect our personal life in which we find our deepest joys are not always present in our minds and when they are, do not always touch the springs of our feelings. No possessions are always equally precious to us. Just a side on this, I felt like at a certain point the light about the resurrection of Jesus turned on. And I would and and then beyond that, he goes to the Father. This is where he's at right now. I would say, God forbid that these would ever fade. Okay. If then the way from the mind to the emotions is not always equally open, there is a reason why there may be faith without the light of joy. If the thoughts are not always equally concentrated on which produce joy, there is a reason we may develop the habit of fearing God, though there be not the present vigorous exercise of faith and consequently but little light. So we are holding on to these spiritual things in a human body, not always equally held with the same intensity and is equally connected to our feelings and emotions as at another time. We need to accept that ebb and flow. I can really relate to that. Other reasons for darkness are um, earthly cares and sorrows, bills that need paid, um, bureaucracy. A big one that I think Ed mentioned, could we be entertaining and allowing a place in us that is distorting God? And that can bring darkness. Um, perhaps we are um, our sin and we're having a lot of negative self-talk, but it's becoming be bigger than God's grace. So that's distorting something. We're going to start seeing darkness. We've been listening to some really um, intense teachings on Jesus being fully man, fully God. And throughout history, when one part of that is embraced over the other, that can become a falsehood. I want to just add one thing that is personal to me. One of my most beautiful sisters in Christ shared with me about realizing she's going through forgetfulness. And as she shared that with me, it was really enlightening to me because she, she shared dealing with it, but without any shame. And I realized we went out of town last week, and instead of laying down some of the responsibilities we have here, I felt like I was just adding on the new rules of this like homeowner where we were renting. I was seeing forgetfulness right and left, doing some pretty numbskull things. And as always, that would bring shame to me. As I kind of rehearsed some of what is speaking through this, I thought this also relates a time of darkness. If you think your brain just isn't firing like it did or like it will, is to rely on God. Don't get shaken up. Lean on God. Rely on God. Okay, so resolve to steal your glance like a laser beam to the occupation of mind and heart unto Jesus. Unto the upright there arises light in darkness. 
Micah 7, 8. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise, even when I sit in darkness. Okay, the last part addressed is not necessarily when it's, it's even out of your own soul, but that God sees you as maturing to the it's addressed to those who fear the lord and his word he just wants you to come up higher he just wants you to increase of quote we never on earth come to such a point as that without any present effort we are sure to continue in the way true habit is a wonderful ally of goodness and it is a great thing to have it on our side but all our lives long, there will be hindrances without and within which need effort and self-repression. On earth, there is no time when it is safe for us to go unarmed. The force of gravitation acts however high we climb. Okay, so an advancing Christian life always needs renewal. Stay on how you first received Jesus. Um, Galatians says the working of miracles, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. How did you receive those? Well, if you've been following that the last 50 years, continue on that and, and let God increase your faith. Um, okay, just ending then. For us all then, the merciful voice of the servant of the Lord calls us to his light. Do not make fires for yourselves like Isaiah 8 warned, especially another spiritual inlet that would be from another source. Find that place of trust that you've been building on for years. Turn it into a laser beam. There was a friar from um, Russia that they said at difficult moments, his face, on his face, one could see courage, concentration, and will which was so strong that it was even frightening. Okay, afterwards shall emerge. What is on the opposite side of this darkness? Afterwards shall, it, shall emerge. It should become the clear vision of a trusted friend and lifelong companion of our souls, who is all in all. At first, the things of the Lord may be a feeble power ruling over our rebel selves, like some king beleaguered in his capital who has no sway beyond its walls. Afterwards, it should become a peaceful sovereign who guides and sways all the powers of the soul and outgoings of the life. He is indeed the author and finisher of our faith and can do whatever he wants to with our faith as he chooses. As one Sunday school teacher in Marysville said a number of times, when you can't trace him, you can still trust him. Thank you. Okay, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for this day, Lord. And we commit ourselves in it to know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. I do hope you have a blessed day.